Hello, everyone, and welcome to Infection Prevention Control for Regulated Health Professionals. This webinar was coordinated by the Colleges of Kinesiologists, Massage Therapists, Occupational Therapists, and Physiotherapists. While four professions collaborated to arrange this, the information presented is applicable across the healthcare setting. Not surprisingly, there was great interest in this webinar and we received over 200 questions. We grouped the questions into themes that our presenters will answer at the end of the presentation. If we didn't answer your question, please do not hesitate to contact your college. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anne Augustine and Catherine Richard, IPAC specialists with Public Health Ontario. We really appreciate you being here and taking time out of what I can only imagine is a very busy schedule. Anne and Catherine, please go ahead. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on COVID-19, Infection Prevention and Control, or IPAC, for Regulated Health Professionals. My name is Catherine Richard, and I am an IPAC specialist with Public Health Ontario's IPAC Regional Support. My colleague, Anne Augustine, is a program IPAC specialist with the IPAC Response and System Support Team. We would like to thank the four colleges for extending the invitation to speak to their members on IPAC and COVID-19 prevention measures. It has certainly been a challenging time for healthcare professionals, and we would like to thank all of you for the great work that you do for your patients and clients. Just a disclaimer before we start the presentation. As you may be aware, ministry guidance and directives change frequently, so the information presented today is only current as of today, and you will need to check the ministry website on a regular basis to obtain updates. You may also want to refer to other applicable ministry's guidance, including the Ministry of Labour. For any discrepancy between the information presented today and your college's guidance, please contact your college to discuss it. The information we are presenting today is by no means everything you need to know about IPAC and COVID-19, but hopefully we will be providing you with a starting point as well as with resources which you can use to find out more detailed information. So at the end of this webinar, Hopefully you will be aware of the routine and COVID-19 specific IPAC measures that you need to take to protect patients and staff, and as well know where to obtain ministry guidance and PHO resources to support safe clinical practice. Public Health Ontario is a provincial government agency who has as its mandate to provide scientific and technical advice and support to clients working in government, public health, healthcare, and related sectors. On our website, we have a number of resources on IPAC in general, as well as COVID-19 specific information. Another partner or resource for you in IPAC is your local public health unit. Here we have linked a tool to help you locate your local unit and we encourage you to find out which one is responsible for, uh, for oversight of IPAC practices in your geographical area. Often there is confusion about our role versus the role of the public health unit. Here is a, a brief overview of each of the roles. So as I mentioned, we're involved with scientific and technical advice, and we're available to contact for questions on IPAC best practices and how to implement them within your setting. The public health unit is responsible for enforcing and for direction related to a number of public health issues, including IPAC. They are involved in outbreak management, and certainly they would be your main contact for any questions on exposures clearance, testing, or contact tracing. We will do our best to answer any questions you have on the presentation, but if we don't get to yours and immediate answers are needed, please feel free to reach out to your local public health unit, your college, or Public Health Ontario's IPAC regional support teams. We have five regional teams that support the province, each team has a group of IPAC specialists who are ready to support you with your questions. There is no wrong entry door, so if you email any of the regions, we will ensure that your inquiry gets sent to the appropriate team to support you. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ministry of Health has been providing guidance, directives, and other information to support the healthcare sector with safe provision of care. 
As mentioned previously, the guidance is updated reg regularly, so we encourage you to check the website on a regular basis. On this slide is a snapshot of the ministry's webpage, and this is where you would find the most up-to-date information. The Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development website also has a number of resources to assist you with COVID-19 measures in the workplace. This is especially helpful for those of you who may own a clinic or have employees in order to understand what your responsibilities are. On this slide, you can see a snapshot of the Ministry of Health's webpage containing the directives. Directive number two is the one that applies to healthcare providers, and you should be familiar with this information as it is regulated under the Health Protection and Promotion Act. Each healthcare sector has specific guidance, and on this slide, you can see the guidance for primary care. If you work in another sector, such as acute care, long-term care, or home care, refer to the specific guidance for that sector as there may be some differences. Also on this slide, you can see the reference documents highlighted in yellow for symptoms and for patient screening, which you will need to become familiar with for the screening process. On our website, we have many resources related to IPAC and you can see three examples here. So the, one, uh, the first one in the upper left is our IPAC main page. The second one on the left is our COVID-19 page. And here we have highlighted the section on healthcare resources in yellow. So if you click on that, you'll, um, you'll go to um, a number of different resources that can assist you with uh, COVID-19 um, measures. And then on the right, uh, we have a cover page for our best practice document on clinical office practice, which is a great resource for any clinic on the everyday IPAC practices that are to be followed. And during this presentation, we will also mention some of the other useful resources that PHO has to support you. Current evidence suggests that the mode of transmission of COVID-19 is through direct contact and respiratory droplets that have the potential to be to be propelled for varying distances. The majority of cases have been linked to person-to-person -person transmission through close direct contact to someone with respiratory symptoms or close contact with a case in the incubation period who was later confirmed to have COVID-19. High viral loads have been identified in individuals who were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic However, uncertainties remain regarding the role of asymptomatic transmission in driving outbreaks in the absence of major droplet releasing symptoms such as coughing and sneezing. Respiratory droplets have been found or have been shown to be propelled up to two meters in most studies and occasionally have been found on the floor up to 13 feet or four meters away from the patient. Transmission through oc the ocular surface is considered a possible route of transmission for COVID-19 based on a recent case report and evidence of virus detection from the eye among cases with conjunctivitis. Whether in a pandemic or during non-pandemic times, it is important for patient and staff safety to follow best practices for IPAC. Most of the practices you will perform during this period are ones that should already have been in place. There are some additional measures that you will need to do related to COVID-19. Routine practices, which were previously known as universal or standard precautions, include a point of, risk, uh, point of care risk assessment, hand hygiene, personal protective equipment or PPE, environmental controls such as cleaning patient care equipment and the environment, and administrative controls such as staff education, policies and procedures, respiratory etiquette, and immunization. COVID-19 measures include ones such as universal or full shift masking, signage and screening, enhanced environmental cleaning, occupational health, and physical distancing, and waiting room setup. We will now go into a bit more detail about routine practices and COVID-19 measures. 
So routine practices are a system of infection prevention and control practices recommended by the Public Health Agency of Canada to be used with all patients during all care to prevent and control transmission of microorganisms in all healthcare settings. So right now we're focused on COVID-19, but at any time um, you want to be practicing routine practices to prevent any type of infection from being transmitted. Before every patient interaction, a healthcare worker is to perform a point of care risk assessment to assess the potential for exposure to infectious disease and determine what PPE needs to be worn. If a patient screens positive for COVID-19 and you will still be providing care, then the PPE required is that for droplet contact precautions. PHO has online learning modules on how to perform a risk assessment and they are available for the acute, long-term care, clinic and home care settings. Hand hygiene is a very important way to prevent the transmission of infection, including COVID-19. It consists of the use of alcohol-based hand rub, or ABHR, and hand washing. In healthcare, the use of ABHR is preferred unless hands are visibly soiled, in which case hand washing would be indicated with soap and water. It is preferred that ABHR is 70 to 90% in healthcare, um, but there is some messaging uh, that does refer to 60%, which will kill COVID-19. The 70% recommendation relates to the product being effective against norovirus. Hand hygiene products need to be available at the point of care. Important to note that gloves are not a substitute for hand hygiene and that ABHR is not to be used on gloves as it does affect the integrity of the glove. Every organization needs to have a policy or procedure that speaks to maintaining a healthy workplace. Now more than ever, staff are to stay home if they have an acute respiratory infection, if they have vomiting and or diarrhea, if they have conjunctivitis or any other communicable disease. Refer to the symptom list from the Ministry of Health when self-monitoring. All staff should have their yearly influenza vaccine and make sure all their vaccinations are maintained up to date. As N95 respirators may be needed for aerosol generating medical procedures, it is essential that staff be fit tested for their N95 respirators at least every two years or any time there is a change in their facial shape. And also um, concerning um, a staff's exposure or developing an occupational illness, make sure that you are, are aware of the requirements uh, for the employer. So either if you have a health, occupational health department, you can speak to them or if not to the Ministry of Labour. Reprocessing, so there are no changes in reprocessing. Single-use devices are not to be reprocessed and reused. Reusable equipment uh, and devices are to be reprocessed based on the Spalding classification and following manufacturer's instructions for use. Spalding is a way of classifying medical equipment to determine what level of reprocessing is required. In uh, most of your uh, settings, you are usually dealing with non-critical equipment, but there are some examples um, of semi-critical and uh, critical equipment, uh, such as uh, in PT, pessary sizing kit, which is considered semi-critical and requires a minimum level, high level disinfection, sterilization preferred. An IMS plunger requires sterilization and any respiratory equipment uh, requires high level disinfection. Uh, or pasteurization. So reprocessing, uh, it's a very complex process. Um, so it's not just cleaning and, and sterilization of instruments before they can be used on the next person. So um, it, I won't go into a lot of details because uh, this process is more um, is, is explained in more detail on our website, but it does consist of a number of steps. So a pre-cleaning step, a cleaning step, uh, inspect and dry, package, sterilize, storage and transport, and um, patient use. So all of this, um, uh, a, uh, you need a quality assurance program included, um, which will uh, involve education and training of staff, 
and the use of chemical indicators, biological indicators, and physical indicators. Um, this is very important to make sure that this process is done safely and effectively. So for laundry, um, it's important that you wear gloves if the laundry or the linens are contaminated with blood or body fluids and wear a gown if it's likely to contaminate your clothing. For any linen in a healthcare setting, it's important to follow these uh, general recommendations and these apply to any healthcare uh, linens. So handle laundry gently without shaking, no pre-rinsing. There are specific requirements for laundering facilities and healthcare settings, including clinical offices. So it needs to be a separate space with negative pressure related to the surrounding areas, hand hygiene facilities, and um, it needs to be done using commercial laundry machines um, following the manufacturer's instructions for use. Um, if you're in a hospital or a, an institution, normally there will be a laundry service there. If you're in a clinic, um, an option that uh, many clinics use is a third-party commercial laundering service. Just because um, household laundry equipment and laundromats do not meet the requirements for laundry in a healthcare setting, for example, the prolonged high temperatures. The exception to this is that you can bring your personal uniform home and launder it there at the end of the day using the hottest washing and drying parameters that the fabric will tolerate. So waste in your settings can be generally categorized into regular waste stream or biomedical waste, and it's the biomedical waste that requires specific handling. So um, when you uh, discard PPE, this can be discarded into the regular waste stream, as well as things like dirty tissues. It's, it's important that it be disposed of, if possible, into a hands-free waste receptacle. Sharps, for example, acupuncture needles are considered biomedical waste, so sharps must be discarded in a sharps container by the person who is using the sharp. Items that are heavily soiled with blood, such as blood that can be squeezed from the item, are to be discarded in a biomedical waste container. Before opening up a clinic or office-based practice, you may choose to do an audit of IPAC practices to help ensure all is in order. To do this, you can use the PHO IPAC checklist for clinical office practice. There is one for the core elements of IPAC and one for reprocessing. For those of you working in a setting other than a clinical office, please refer to your sectors or your facility's specific guidance. So PPE, this is a really important um, uh, part of the presentation and, and certainly it's one that we, we do get a lot of questions on. So um, we'll talk about PPE in general and then get into more specifics uh, around the COVID-19 measures. So if you come into contact with blood or body fluids, then gloves are indicated. Always perform hand hygiene before putting gloves on Gloves must be removed and discarded immediately after the task is complete, followed by hand hygiene. Gloves are task specific and single use for the task. Do not use them in hallways or non-patient care areas. If you anticipate that you're going to be splashed or sprayed, then use a gown. Reusable or disposable isolation gowns used as PPE should be approved by Health Canada and be available in several sizes. Reusable gowns are to be laundered between uses in commercial machines. You don't need to change your clothes in between patients unless they are soiled. Surgical and procedure masks uh, protect the nose and mouth. Cloth masks are not recommended for healthcare workers at work as their effectiveness has not been verified. When wearing a mask, dispose of it immediately if it becomes wet or soiled, clean your hands and replace the mask. Eye protection protects eyes from contamination from a cough or sneeze. It can include goggles, a face shield, or a visor attached to a mask. Prescription eyewear is not considered to be acceptable eye protection. Reusable eye protection, such as goggles, need to be cleaned and disinfected between uses. 
Face shields are not to be used as a substitute for a mask. N95 respirators are worn for aerosol generating procedures with COVID-19 patients or with patients who have an airborne disease such as active TB. Staff who use respirators must be fit tested at least every two years. The medical procedures that are listed as aerosol generating or AGMPs are supported by data that indicate these procedures may significantly increase risk of infection to healthcare workers within close range of the procedure. And so N95 respirators are required as a minimum level of respiratory protective equipment, as well as eye protection. These procedures artificially manip manipulate the airway and the secretions therein. So some examples of AGMPs would be breath stacking, um, use of a CPAP um, machine or a high flow oxygen, which would mean over six liters a minute. It would not include um, um, such activities such as chest physiotherapy, uh, a stress test, um, oral hygiene or a feeding assessment. Uh, these would not be considered um, aerosol generating. It is really, uh, can't emphasize this enough, uh, important that staff know how to put on and take off PPE properly to avoid contaminating themselves. PHO has a number of posters that can be printed off and posted so that staff can follow the proper procedure. So I've included a link here uh, to our website. It's a nice poster that you can print off and post if you would like to do that. These lanyard cards are also available for download on our website and can be printed off for staff as reminders. Designate your donning and doffing areas and have the sequence posted to assist staff. It's also important to have ABHR and a hands-free waste receptacle available where staff will be removing PPE. PHO has a number of short videos on PPE donning or putting on and doffing or taking off that can help train staff on how to use PPE properly. Staff training is critical to prevent transmission of infection through contamination during patient interactions and PPE removal. Annual IPAC training is recommended and practical demonstrations of PPE donning and doffing is a good way for staff to practice and receive feedback on their technique. So this might be something you wanna think about for a team meeting, um, practicing putting it on and taking it off and, and, um, and providing each other with feedback. PHO also has online uh, IPAC core competency and reprocessing in the community courses that are free to all. This is a new resource that we have. It's called Infection Prevention and Control Fundamentals. And this resource contains a number of links to PHO resources to help train staff in IPAC. Um, so it refers to a number of best practice training resources, and it's uh, meant to serve as an introduction to prepare newly introduced um, healthcare professionals um, to the fundamentals of IPAC but it can also be used by any healthcare professional to build on existing IPAC knowledge. So looking at COVID-19, um, and this is from the uh, Ministry of Health uh, document, um, these are the specific um, PPE uh, re recommendations or requirements, depending on whether the patient screens positive or negative. So for the first one, before every patient interaction, uh, we talked about this earlier, um, conducting a point of care risk assessment to determine the level of precautions required. So if you have a patient who screens positive, um, you need to put droplet and contact precautions in place. So droplet and contact precautions include wearing a surgical or procedure mask, an isolation gown, gloves, and eye protection, and as mentioned before, performing hand hygiene before and after contact with the patient and the patient environment and after the removal of PPE. For a patient who screens negative, you would be wearing a surgical procedure mask the use of eye protection should be considered. Given that your eyes are one of the portals of entry on your face, it may be prudent to wear eye protection. Uh, 
and of course, hand hygiene before and after contact with the patient and the patient environment and after the removal of PPE. Best practice is always to remove your PPE in between patients, but during this pandemic, there has been a shortage of supplies and resources, so extended wear has been permitted, but care must be taken not to contaminate yourself. For full shift masking, you could wear your mask for extended periods, but it must be changed if it becomes wet or soiled. Eye protection could also be worn for extended periods. Gloves must always be changed in between patients, and Anne will be discussing this in a bit more detail later. So for PPE use with suspect or confirmed COVID-19 patients, we do have two resources available on our website to help you understand the PPE needed. So there's the first one is IPAC recommendations for use of PPE um, with care of individuals who are suspect or confirmed, and as well, droplet and, and contact precautions in non-acute care facilities. And we also do have one for acute care facilities. So I'm going to turn you over now to my colleague, Anne, um, for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Catherine. So we've just reviewed the IPAC elements that have remained the same and has had a discussion with respect to personal protective equipment. Now we'll switch gears and focus on the IPAC elements that have changed since COVID-19 pandemic. What are the changes in delivering care with COVID-19? Well, one of the first things that you uh, would want to change is how to limit, uh, limit how patients and clients can access your space, your office, or your clinic. As they enter, there should be signage indicating the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 as stated in the ministry reference document for symptoms. And if the your patients or clients have any of these symptoms, they need to notify a staff member. The sign should also ask them to perform hand hygiene with uh, ABHR and to don a mask if they are not already wearing a mask. They are also to use respiratory etiquette should they have to cough or sneeze. Tissues in a hands-free wastebasket should be available just in case the person needs them. Next slide, please. The next in, uh, step in office setup is a staggering of appointments. The number of people who can safely be in the waiting area will clearly depend on your space. Stagger or book appointments such that patients, clients can easily maintain physical distancing of two meters or six feet. Take into consideration the need for an essential visitor or support person for children or those requiring assistance. These people will have to be able to physically distance themselves from others in the waiting room too. Physical distancing can be supported by how you space the chairs. If many clients need support, consider placing chairs in groups of two Remove all non-essential chairs. Remove toys, magazines, and other non-cleanable items from the waiting room. Also think about how many staff you will need to have in the office to support physical distancing of two meters between healthcare workers as well. Next slide, please. Screening. So passive screening is done as people enter your clinic because they're going to be walking past that sign that discusses the signs and symptoms of COVID-19. But you also have to do active screening. So active screening is carried out, first of all, over the phone when booking the appointment using the ministry screening tool. And then it's done again when the patient or client arrives at the clinic. Staff conducting screening on site should ideally be behind a barrier to protect them from droplet and contact spread. A plexiglass barrier can protect reception staff from sneezing and coughing patients or clients. If a plexiglass barrier is not available, staff should remain a two meter distance from the patient. If the office is unable to provide this physical barrier, 
then the healthcare worker doing the screening should use droplet and contact precautions. As per the COVID-19 guidance, primary care providers in a community setting, version 5, dated May 22nd, the healthcare worker doing the screening would don the following PPE. Gloves, an isolation gown, a surgical or procedure mask, and eye protection, which can be goggles or a face mask, face shield. Next slide, please. So, management of a patient who screens positive. If a patient screens positive over the phone, the appointment should be deferred if possible and the individual referred for testing. Only see patients in the office who screen positive if you are able to follow droplet and contact precautions and you are knowledgeable on how to properly don and doff PPE safely. Patients who screen positive at the office should be given a surgical procedure mask and be advised to perform hand hygiene and then immediately placed in a treatment area away from others. Next slide, please. The purpose of universal or masking and uh, uh, full shift masking is source control. So the mask is being worn to protect others. The reason we do this is we know some individuals can be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and be shedding viruses. So all patients, clients, and their essential visitor or support person are to be wearing masks. These can be either a cloth mask or a procedure mask. However, remember, patients who screen positive should be given a surgical slash procedure mask and be asked to uh, perform their hand hygiene. Full shift masking or uh, using a yeah, surgical or procedure mask is recommended for all staff working outside of direct patient care areas when interacting with other healthcare workers and physical distancing cannot be maintained. Ideally, masks worn for the full shift masking should be discarded once removed, but if supplies are limited, they may be reused as long as they are not visibly soiled, wet, or otherwise damaged. After use, these masks are to be handled in a manner that minimizes the potential for cross-contamination. Remove the mask down and away from your face. Do not touch the front of the mask. If the mask is to be reused, keep it from becoming contaminated by storing it in a clean paper bag or in a cleanable container with a lid. Paper bags are to be discarded after each use. Reusable containers are to be cleaned and disinfected after each use. Bagged containers are to be labeled with the individual's name to prevent accidental misuse. So somebody else using the wrong mask. Hand hygiene is to be performed before putting on and after removing your mask or otherwise after handling the mask. Next slide, please. So if you're feeling unwell as a staff member, what do you do? Everyone working in your office, clinic, area are to be self-monitoring and assessing themselves for symptoms of COVID-19. If you're feeling unwell while you're at work, immediately self-isolate. So that is, remove yourself from providing care or interacting with other staff in the office. If you are feeling unwell at home, immediately self-isolate in your home and don't go to work. In either case, Notify your immediate manager, supervisor, or your occupational health and safety department of your facility, and then contact either your health care provider, telehealth, or your local public health unit. Most importantly, do not come to work when you are ill. Next slide, please. Environmental cleaning is another very important uh, component of controlling COVID-19. All common areas should be regularly cleaned, so that's at least daily, 
and you can refer to the Public Health Ontario document on cleaning and disinfection for public settings for information on how to clean the common areas of your office or clinic. The treatment areas need to be cleaned. Um, all the horizontal surfaces and equipment used to provide patient care, for example, the exam table, the thermometer, the BB cuff, need to be cleaned and disinfected before another patient is either brought into the treatment room or you use that equipment on another patient. The plexiglass barriers that are used at, say, reception are also to be included in the routine cleaning. And you clean those with a product that will not affect the integrity or the function of that particular barrier. Next slide, please. Here's some key points to remember when it comes to environmental cleaning. Items have to be clean before you can disinfect them. So you can use a two-step process where you clean using a detergent, and then you follow that with disinfection using a disinfectant, or you can use a one-step process using a product which contains a cleaner and a disinfectant. No matter which process you use, all disinfectants that are used in the healthcare setting require a DIN, or a drug identification number. This number is assigned to the product by Health Canada when the product is accepted for use in Canada. Ready-to-use products are preferred. Never use a spray bottle, as this will create aerosols of the cleaning solution, and this could be an occupational health hazard. Always follow instructions for use, particularly for dilution of the product, if it's not a ready-to-use product, and the contact time. The contact time is how long the solution has to sit on a surface or an item in order to be able to kill the bacteria and viruses from the label claim. Next slide, please. And then lastly, there's always that non-cleanable equipment. So here are some ideas um, for managing these types of equipment. So this, some of this equipment will be made of fabric or paper, and it cannot be cleaned or disin, uh, disinfected. So consider trying, first of all, to find a cleanable alter alternative. Dedicating the, pro the item to one patient or have the patient bring in their own item. Clean the patient's hands before and after using the non-cleanable equipment. If the patient is showing symptoms of a communicable illness, defer the use of this type of equipment. Laminate paper products uh, so that they can be easily wiped. And if the equipment becomes damaged or soiled, replace it. Or consider the use of uh, barriers or covers. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide and next slide, please. And this one show the references that we used for the development of uh, this um, uh, webinar today. And then we have a question period. So thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar. Are there any questions? Um, thank you so much, Catherine and Anne. That was really good information and a lot of good reminders, hopefully, that our registrants find useful. Um, again, we received quite a few questions coming in, so I have a few here that I will read off for you. And so the first one that we got was, how long does COVID last on surfaces? Thanks, Ryan. Uh, that's a, a very common question. Um, so the period of time that COVID lasts on surfaces, it really depends on the type of surface. So for example, it can be a few hours on paper or it could be a few days if it's on wood, steel or plastic. Um, and it, But that's not to say that all virus that is found on surfaces days later is viable or infectious. And um, so far, this route of transmission has not been found to be significant, um, but it really reinforces why hand hygiene as well as cleaning and disinfection of environmental surfaces and equipment between patients is so important. Thank you. 
Thank you. And another common question that we got is, what is the best way to air out a room? Does an air purifier work? What about air conditioning? Is opening the windows effective? So as we discussed previously, COVID-19 is transmitted from one person to another via contact in droplets. It's not transmitted through the airborne route. Having said that, there are some procedures that are considered to be aerosol generating procedures, for example, intubation. So for these types of procedures, there are special considerations for the design of the room uh, where the care is provided. So, for example, intubations done in an airborne isolation room. And uh, when one may enter the room, uh, and when one may enter the room without wearing an N95 respirator. Procedures such as cardiac stress tests, uh, chest physiotherapy outside of breath stacking are not considered to be aerosol generating procedures. So really, uh, generally, the type of care that is provided as a massage therapist, a kinesiologist, physiotherapist, or occupational therapist is not aerosol generating, so there is uh, no need to uh, air out uh, a room. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. I think that provided some really good clarity. And then another question that we got as well, um, are carpeted surfaces safe? How should I clean them? Should I replace them? Sure, so I'll take this question as well. So carpeting is not considered a good flooring choice in any healthcare facility or clinic because of the difficulty in cleaning the carpet and the carpet's ability to harbor dust and, and spores, for example, Clostridium difficile. So if you have carpets in your office or clinics, there's two recommendations. The carpets must be cleaned on a regular basis by a trained environmental surface worker using specialized carpet cleaning equipment and procedures. And this is as specified by the material used in the carpet. And make a plan to replace the carpet. Older carpets should be prioritized uh, for removal first. So no carpet. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that, Anne. And again, also with, um, you know, typical with our professions, uh, there is sometimes the use of massage tables. And one question that we got a lot of is, do I need a vinyl layer on top of my massage table? Well, I'll take this one too. So a vinyl layer is not required on top of a massage table. The most important thing uh, is that massage tables or other exam tables are always cleaned with a low-level disinfectant between each patient or client. So a low-level disinfectant uh, used is to be a healthcare, qual healthcare quality one, and it needs to have the DIN or the drug identification number. So you, you just need to clean it in between patients. Thanks. Thank you again for that. And uh, Anne and Catherine, I know you mentioned this um, in the presentation, but again, just to repeat it for all of our viewers, because uh, this is a question that we are getting a lot. Do I need to replace my surgical mask after each patient or client interaction? So um, you don't need to uh, replace it after each uh, client interaction. Um, it, it really depends on um, if the, the patient has screened um, positive or negative. So uh, if it's uh, the patient has screened negative, uh, you're, you're just doing the universal masking and, and potentially the eye protection. And you could um, keep that on from patient to patient as long as you don't touch or manipulate the, uh, the facial protection. Um, if you're uh, working with a client who screens positive, um, then uh, ideally you, um, you need to change um, in between uh, each patient. Or uh, what we do recommend is if you have a positive uh, patient, um, you may want to see them at the end of the day, and then you can remove all your PPE and um, either discard it or um, clean and disinfect it. I hope that Helen? helps. <laughs> yes, that is very helpful. Thanks for that, Catherine. And again, many of our registrants do provide um, care to their patients and clients in the homes. So um, what should these registrants do if they are providing home care? What types of things should they be keeping in mind? 
So thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, home care uh, can be challenging because really it's an uncontrolled environment. But um, as a healthcare uh, worker in um, providing home care, if you follow the same routine practices and COVID-19 additional precautions that we've talked about today, you should be fine. So for example, you would wanna screen patients as well as any other household members before entering the home to confirm that no one is symptomatic or positive for COVID-19. If you identify an infection risk due to a positive screen or some other uh, type of clinical condition, then use the appropriate PPE to protect yourself. And then whatever equipment you may be bringing in um, to the home for assessment or treatment, um, you wanna make sure that you uh, clean and disinfect it uh, when you leave the home. I'm going to, we sound like a broken record, but definitely the hand hygiene before entering the home and leaving the home, um, as well as um, before donning and doffing your PPE. Thanks. No worries about sounding like broken records. These are all very good uh, <laughs> messages to hammer home to registrants. Uh, so I have two more questions for you just because we are running a little tight on time. So another question that we got a lot of was, I work in a small room and I'm in close contact with patients slash clients. And there is a bit of uh, fear, so to speak, associated with this. So what is the risk of being in a small room with a patient or a client? How can I keep safe when I'm doing my, uh, my job? So that's completely understandable. And um, because we know that COVID-19 is transmitted through that direct contact and respiratory droplets. So if you need to be in close contact to provide the care, then follow the ministry guidance and the, and the IPAC practices to reduce your risk. So this means the screening of all patients before the visit. If a patient is symptomatic, then consider deferring the visit unless it's urgent or medically necessary. If they screen negative, then again, wearing that procedure mask at all times and within two meters of the patient and then consider adding the eye protection because we know that it can be transmitted through the eyes. Again, perform hand hygiene before and after touching the patient and really be scrupulous about not touching your face or your mask and eye protection. I hope that helps. Yes, that was very helpful indeed. And we'll close off with one final question that we got a lot of. Um, you know, naturally, this is a very uncertain time and people are worried about their health and the health of their family. So as a health professional, how do I keep my family safe during this time? So that's, again, um, completely understandable and uh, no one wants to bring an infection home um, to their family. So uh, really, um, the main way that you keep safe and you keep your family safe is following the infection prevention control practices that we've prevented uh, that we've presented on today so really important that you review and practice how to put on and take off your ppe safely as this is a way that because really wearing the PPE is what's going to help protect you um, and it's also a way that you could contaminate yourself if you if you take it off um, in the wrong way. Um, it's also important to self-monitor for signs and symptoms. And if, if you're concerned at all about an exposure, um, then contact your local public health unit who can help you get testing. So these are all ways that um, really for any of us, um, and especially for healthcare workers, they can keep themselves and their families safe. All right, thank you for that, Catherine. So that is all the time that we have for questions. Uh, just as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be available to uh, all college registrants, and we will be posting uh, it on our website along with a, a frequently asked questions document and then some links that were mentioned in this presentation. As a general reminder to everyone who's on the webinar today, each college does have its own individual guidance, which you can check out by visiting our websites. And of course, as you see there up on screen, if you have any questions, you can of course contact your uh, local IPAC specialist. So once again, Catherine and Anne, I really appreciate you taking the time. This was valuable information. It was very good information. And uh, we know that our registrants are well equipped uh, moving forward as we navigate this return to work dynamic. So thank you both once again, and I hope everyone else has a great afternoon. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you very much.